Hello everyone, Guardian E here with a first impression video for Fire Emblem Heroes. That's right, not a reaction because we already got these units revealed just yesterday during the Fate Channel itself, but we are getting the actual trailer for the new seasonal units, the new pirate themed units in Perilous Seas. So naturally, I'm pretty excited for this batch of units, well for one unit in particular I'll just say. And since we already know what these units look like, we're not going to be doing a blind reaction, since it's not blind. We're just going to go straight into the analysis. We're going to cut through this and basically look at the skills and the art uh, as we're phasing through the trailer for the first time. I would like to take just a quick second to remind folks that if you do enjoy the content that we put out, whether they're for Fire Emblem Heroes or any of the other games that we cover, please consider subscribing to the channel so that you get notified when we do put out a new video. Uh, leave a like down below and leave a comment as well, advising us of what types of content that you'd like to see from us in the future. So with that, let us get into it. All right. The pirate theme returns a vast ye land lovers, special heroes to battle. And of course, okay, they're starting things off with Surtur here, Pirate of Red Sky. I love the shark in the attack animation that they've got. Yeah, so he is going to be a Lance armor unit. And yeah, I, I, I just love stylistically the, the art that they chose for him. It has this very rough around the edge appeal. His like billowing coat behind him has the, a bright orange that kind of mirrors sort of the fire element that he holds dear to him. The shading and the coloring itself is very watercolor-esque. Again... It's rough, rough around the seas, rough around Surtur. I think it fits really well. And I do like the design of the whole anchor axe. I think it's obviously on theme, very appropriate. Um, and yeah, I don't know. He, he very much looks the uh, the pirate captain part. I guess his his stature, his statuesque stature, um, just as well as uh, his overall rough facial hair and everything else. Pretty good, pretty good fit, I would say, uh, as far as the seasonal is concerned. So, taking a look at his weapon, oh, and it's a lance, not a, not an axe. So, uh, C Seer Lance, it's his own exclusive weapon, 16 might, accelerate special trigger cooldown count minus one, so a killer slaying effect. If foe initiates combat, or if foe's HP is greater than or equal to 75% at the start of combat, inflicts attack defense of minus six on foe during combat. And also, if foe can make a follow-up attack, reduces damage from foe's first attack during combat by 75%. Okay, that's not bad. Killer slaying effect is always solid. Condition for the rest of the weapon is relatively easy to meet. Player phasing, as well as having a health condition on the opponent above 75%, when you really want the additional bonuses on Surtur, so, uh, or rather the debuffs on the enemy, so minus 6 to attack and defense is going to let him do more damage and take less damage in combat. And then essentially, if he's going to get doubled, the first attack is going to get reduced by 75%. So um, pretty good for him. If he's attacking into somebody and he's going to double them, that works well because if uh, they're going to double back and he has low speed, um, that means that he is going to basically only take 25% uh, damage from the first hit. Um, because if uh, I see that he has Crafty Fighter down there, so he is going to get a guaranteed follow-up attack in a lot of instances. He's going to attack, the enemy is going to counter, he's only going to take 25% of that, and then he's going to attack again and hopefully kill with that second attack. Uh, he has Bonfire for the special, and that's going to be at a two-turn cooldown, which of course means that when he initiates, gets attacked back, he's going to proc Bonfire on the on the. Uh, on his own follow-up, so that kind of works well with the CC or Lance. Defense has ideal 4 for the A slot. At start of combat, if unit's HP is equal to 100%, or if bonus is active on unit, grants defense res plus 7 to unit during combat. At start of combat, if unit's HP is 100% and bonus is active, grants an additional defense res plus 2 to unit during combat. I've said it before, the ideal skills are really great because they do kind of push the ceiling as far as um, A slot stat boosting skills and so you can get ultimately plus nine to defense and res uh, as long as you have a little bit of planning associated with it he needs 100 percent hp as well as an activated buff on him and he enjoys a plus nine but at a bare minimum as long as he has one of those he gets plus seven which is definitely nothing to scoff at regardless uh, crafty fighter three for the b slot if units hp is greater than or equal to 25 percent and foe initiates combat a uh, unit makes a guaranteed follow-up attack and inflicts special cooldown charge minus one on foe's foe per attack. Oh, you know, I actually forgot which one Crafty Fighter 3 was when I was saying it synergized with CC or Lance. Because I thought you got a follow-up attack on, on player phase, but it's actually only on enemy phase so you get a follow-up attack. 
I don't know if that works especially well with the damage reduction that CC or Lance gives, because if you're going to be taking and doing a follow-up attack, if the enemy doubles you, that means that the enemy is going to hit you twice. So they're going to attack into you, you're going to counter, they're going to follow-up attack, and then you're going to, um, Surtur's going to counter again, or a follow-up attack. Uh, which means that he is essentially going to take a full attack in there. So it may actually make more sense to give him a player phase oriented B slot skill just because CC or Lance uh, tends to be player phase oriented. At the same time, there's something to be said about having mixed bonuses on both player phase and enemy phase. Um, but regardless, Crafty Fighter 3 is a useful skill to have. Uh, Surtur's portent for the C slot at start of turn, if unit is within four spaces of a foe, inflicts attack. Speed defense res minus 5 on fo closest foes through their next actions and grants plus 5 to all stats to unit for one turn. So this is obviously his own exclusive C-slot skill, an extension, a magnification of Surtur's Menace, which makes a lot of sense here. Um, honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw Surtur's portent getting tacked on to Surtur himself, the original version of Surtur, in the future. Um, I could definitely see that happening at some point. So yeah, Surtur is going to be super, super tanky, and Surtur's Portent actually has enough range where it can be act essentially a, a team debuff, where uh, you can have your allies take advantage of Surtur's Portent while Surtur is kind of in the back laying down that debuff on the enemy, and minus 5 to all stats is a very, very solid debuff. So yeah, I think that he's solid, even if some of his base skills don't really mesh perfectly, you can obviously swap those out to fit the needs that you have uh, on your team and how you want Surtur to run, so... Yeah, he's got good stuff. Okay, very tanky, and there he goes. He's got a grin on his face, for sure. I do like that toothy grin he's got as he's rearing back, ready to strike. Uh, and again, it's a very unique, interesting use of color. The, the, just the blues and the grays in his pants, and even like the shading of his skin, as well as the hair and the swooping coat behind him. It's, it's honestly pretty nice. And then his special art, he's the shark. I really like the shark. The shark piece of this is super cool. Uh, and then you have the glint in the eye. I certainly appreciate that. The flames erupting. That's certainly Surtur, right? All right. Okay, here's Sea's Shadow. <laughs> Nesala is certainly looking dapper in the all black with the burgundy highlights. Very, very classy. Does fit the whole raven look that he's got going, of course. And he's got feathers perched in the pirate hat as well to kind of really uh, drive home that element to things. Looks like he's holding a little jewelry box, so he's got some spoils with him. I do like that, despite, again, the, the well-put-together outfit that he has, it is rough around the edges, too. You got, like, the scuffs on the pants, and then the hem of the uh, of the coat that he's got are, is also... It's, you know, a little worse for wear. He's seen some action. He's been on an adventure, uh, and he's uh, he's got the scars to show for it. So he is going to be a Flying Beast Unit Red. That is interesting. It's an interesting combination. Let's see what skills he brings to the table as well alongside him. So Crossbones Claw. It's going to be a unique weapon to him. 14 Might. Accelerate special trigger, cooldown count minus one, so killer slaying effect. If unit is not adjacent to an ally, inflicts speed defense minus six on foe and neutralizes effects that prevent units follow-up attacks during combat, right? Uh, if unit is not adjacent to an ally and unit initiates combat while transformed, unit can make a follow-up attack before the foe can counterattack. All right, at start of turn, if unit is adjacent, so the, the standard beast condition, right? Um, for the transformation, and then because he's a flying uh, beast unit, he gets uh, attack plus two uh, and an additional movement space uh, upon transformation. So that's uh, that's a pretty packed weapon, I have to say. Killer slaying effect, as I said, always solid. Um, and then the condition is just not being adjacent to an ally. And similar with cavalry, these units tend to be able to overextend. That's why solo skills are pretty good on them, which is why he also has a solo skill on him. And because of that, uh, it's going to be very easy for him to enjoy the minus six speed and defense on the foe. That's going to allow him to double more handily and do more damage, which is exactly what he wants because the enemy can't do anything to neutralize his ability to naturally follow up. You know, those wary fighters aren't going to do anything as far as preventing him from following up. And then furthermore, he's going to have a built-in desperation. So if he is transformed, as long as he is uh, player-facing, not only is he going to not be able to 
Not only is the enemy not going to be able to stop him from doing a follow-up attack, he's going to follow-up attack immediately after and t attack twice in a row. I mean, that's exactly what a player-facing glass cannon wants in a package um, on steroids. That's exactly what they want. They want built-in desperation. They want to uh, be able to follow-up attack unhindered. They want the debuff on the enemy, not only to uh, enhance the ability to double, but also... Uh, do more damage and then the killer slaying effect means that glimmer is going to be at a one turn cooldown Which means that when he attacks into somebody while transformed he is going to be able to proc glimmer on the second attack I mean I don't really need to say more than that That is an exceptionally potent combination and it is going to be uh, exceedingly powerful on the battlefield uh, Attack speed solo 4 is going to work exceptionally well because of course he is want he wants to be solo because of crossbones claw Attack speed solo 4 synergizes with that and just gives him an, ad an additional a uh, whopping plus 7 to attack and speed during combat when he's not near an enemy Speed defense near trace 3 once again uh, Speed defense minus 3 on foe just stacking on that those debuffs on the enemy Which is very hard to it's hard for the enemy to uh, avoid those in combat debuffs and so that's going to be basically a minus nine to speed and defense. That is very significant uh, on the enemy. And then enables Kanto remainder plus one, which essentially means that any movement that he hasn't used when he attacks into an enemy plus one, those are the tiles he gets back as a Kanto. So at the very worst, he's going to get back one movement tile, but depending on how far he has or hasn't moved, um, he will be able to move back or move more than just the one space. That obviously works very well with his additional movement tile when transformed. Um, that just further enhances and works very well with Kanto. And then we got Stall Ploy 3 for the C slot. At start of turn, inflict Stall on foes in cardinal directions with HP minus, uh, less than unit's HP. Stall means if unit has unit can move one extra space, converts that effect into restricts movement to one space through its next actions huh that's interesting that's very very specific uh, yeah i mean that is exceedingly niche against certain team compositions that could really come in handy because it's very unique in what it does but against every other team composition it will do absolutely nothing so i it's i guess it's a nice c slot skill to have as an option it's certainly not going to be a general use c slot skill an interesting tool to have in the toolbox but at the end of the day not going to be a go-to c slot skill so nasala is going to be a player phase powerhouse here he is all out offense he's gonna have that extended range go out there transformed attack twice in a row murder somebody with glimmer and then be able to fall back if he has at least one space because of the kanto the near trace three and, and that's a very potent combination. That's going to be very, very deadly. So watch out. Definitely watch out. Okay, transformation. Love the hat on the raven. And there he is. Love the energy that's kind of wrapping around uh, his hand at its outstretched there as he's kind of clawing forward in his human form. Um, and I also like the just the jewelry and the crown and the golden skull that's kind of just whirling around him too. Just lots of spoils to enjoy. Where's the treasure? The treasure is all around you, Nysala. Just take a look. Um, he's going to fly in and do the two attacks in a row. There he goes. And then there is, of course, the Kanto showing that off. Okay. All right, so we've got C Dark Wing making her debut in the game. Of course, we've got Vika, and she is going to be a flying colorless beast unit, and that is very interesting. Not a combination that you see all too often. I like the scouting telescope that she's got. She has kind of this deadpan expression on her face, which actually is, is pretty cute, I have to say. And speaking of cute, her pirate outfit is super adorable. Like the cutoff shorts, like the poofy sleeves, the uh, wrap around the waist cloth, as well as the kind of tail that she's got behind her. Um, there's sort of more duller, muted colors as far as her outfit is concerned. Lots of oranges and browns and whites, uh, or off-color whites. And even her hair is kind of a duller green. And I feel like that just serves to accentuate really the, the piercing blue of her eyes, which I think is, it's a nice touch overall. There's also something very cuddly and soft about the feathers of her wings, almost dove-like in how soft they look. Um, I, I guess she does a good job in preening them. I don't know, but <laughs> they look pretty great. And, uh, and yeah, so uh, she is going to be the four-star demote of the banner, as I understand it. But uh, let's take a look at what skill she's got as the four-star demote. Could still have some good stuff. 
And as a four-star demo, she is actually going to have her own unique weapon. So Ebon Pirate Claw, 14 Might, grants res plus three. At start of turn, if foe's res is less than unit's res, and that foe is adjacent to another foe, inflicts defense res minus seven on that foe through their next actions. At start of combat, if foe's HP is greater than or equal to 75%, grants plus five to attack speed res to unit during combat. And then if she transforms, she gets to move one extra space and plus two attack. So that is kind of interesting. It seems like she is going to be res heavy, which is, again, sort of just an odd, uh, that's an odd peaking stat for, I think, her archetype in general. Uh, she's not a ranged unit. So again, having that additional res. So the, the, the res that she has is going to make its way in, into helping her proc her, um, the, the debuff effect for her Ebon Pirate Claw. I, I gotta say, it's just, uh, it's a little situational again. I mean, I, mean, I don't know what her res stat is going to be, but it does feel still a little situational. It, I, I, it is, does borrow from the skills that do the same thing, but I also don't absolutely love those skills. You have the res condition, and then also the foe has to be um, next to or adjacent to another ally of theirs. Um, it is a map-wide debuff, so that's always nice, and uh, it's kind of a bonus. So it, it's there if it if it procs, that's great. If it doesn't, um, you still get this second effect, which is uh, at the start of combat, um, as long as foe's HP is greater than or equal to 75%, she gets plus five to attack speed and res, which is fairly decent. So, you know, at the very least, you're going to get that. And then you have the potential of having a support wide, uh, map wide debuff um, that could be inflicted on the basis of whether or not you meet the res condition and the foes are adjacent to one another. Glacius for the special. Boost damage by 80% of units res. That's going to fit very nicely if she has all of these res boosting stats, uh, stats and skills. Speed res solo three. If unit is not adjacent to an ally, grant speed res plus seven during combat. So speed res solo three. Again, the solo skills work very well with flying beast units given their mobility. What I will say is that the res boost that this is giving won't actually help to meet the condition for Ebon Pirate Claw's uh, effect. Because the the check, the res check for Edmund Pirate Claw is at the start of the turn. Speed res solo three, that boost is only active during combat. So it, it's kind of interesting. You would think that if you really want to tack on the res for her, you'd want a an actually flat bo res boosting stat, uh, red res boosting skill for the A slot instead of an in combat buff. Um, sabotage attack three for the B slot at start of turn. If foe's res is less than or equal to units res minus three. And that foe is adjacent to another foe, inflicts attack minus seven on that foe through its next action. So, again, I'm not the. I don't really love the sabotage skills. They're a huge annoyance, especially on like enemy troops, but um, it does kind of fit her archetype. So, I, I mean, they're trying to make it so that her res is very substantial, and that is going to synergize with Ebon Pirate Claw because it's essentially going to give a minus seven debuff to all enemies on the entire map um, that have less res than her and are adjacent to an ally, which is relatively easy, easy to manipulate. So you can kind of get that going. So that, that has value. Minus seven is ne certainly nothing to scoff at as far as debuffs are concerned. Um, so it, it's, it's an interesting niche that she fulfills here. I do like that they kind of went all in on it um, in, in that, that was they're trying to like essentially make her a support map-wide debuffer. Um, I, I just think it's interesting. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at her attacking animation. Okay, she's going to transform. Love the little bandana. And here she is attacking. Love the golden coins flying around. You have the golden wisps around her as well. You get some more highlights in her hair from the light and the effects of the special, of course, uh, which is which is a nice touch. And generally speaking with the beast units, I kind of like how their pose is a little bit more predatory where they're leaning forward, ready to slash, even when they aren't like transformed in the like attacking art. It's just kind of a, a nice consistency thing. Your life. So there she goes, proccing that Glacies, which is going to do tons of damage. And here we have the fair pirate pair. Yes, we do have Hinoka and Camilla, both from Fire Emblem Fates as a duo unit. They are going to be a flying green bow user. Hinoka is brandishing that bow with the ornate mermaid design on the front of it. It's very, very nice. And of course, Camilla has a, a scimitar back there as that she's wielding. 
This is honestly a pair that I was expecting to see at some point in the game as a duo. It just fits really well to have both of the Elder Sisters and Fates kind of teaming up together as a duo unit. I wasn't really expecting it to happen on a pirate-themed banner, but here we are and they look pretty fantastic. You can see that Hinoka has sort of an anchor arrow in her hand. It's a really cool design because the arrowhead is an anchor and then the feather cap at the end of it actually looks like a sail. So. You know, points for ingenuity there. I think that's really nice. Overall, the aesthetic is just bright and beautiful. Lots of gorgeous colors here. Thematically, of course, Camilla really striking purples. And uh, Hinoko with the fiery reds. You even have some carryover on the straps and ropes on each of them. Like Hinoka, for example, has a purple rope that's coming down around her side and around her hip. And then Camilla has a red one coming around her hip as well. Really, really nice. Certainly one of the more conservative designs for Camilla for sure, but she looks fantastic. And both of them together certainly epitomize this kind of rough and tumble gypsy look, which I think is just really appropriate and really fetching, and it fits them both very well. So, um, yeah, I think they did a fantastic job on the art. Let's, let's keep going here and uh, take a look at their skills. I'm eager to see what their weapon does, because I do have some trepidation about it, them being a green archer. I will just say up front that I think that most other colors would have worked better. <laughs> Colorless would have been much better, but uh, honestly, red would have worked well just because Hinoka doesn't have a red variant at all. Um, blue would have worked better because Camilla is light on the blue representation on her side of things. Green is heavy on Camilla. Camilla has two greens that, that she already utilizes to great effect. Hinoka already has a green, so not really in love with the color choice, but let's take a look at the weapon itself. So Mermaid Bow, it's 14 might, uh, effective against armor units. Okay, so it's effective against flying and armor units. Grants attack plus 3. At start of combat, if unit's HP is greater than or equal to 25%, grants attack speed plus 6 to unit during combat, and calculates damage using the lower... Okay, so adaptive damage, which I know a lot of people were speculating th that they were going to have. And also, if unit initiates combat, unit speed is greater than foe speed, and unit has weapon triangle advantage... Unit attacks twice. Uh, I gotta say, I really don't like that weapon uh, effect at all. I mean, unless their duo skill does something to remedy the weapon triangle part of this, that's really restrictive. Like, I just, I really don't like that at all. Um, so, effective against armor foes is excellent. I mean, that's always going to be good. Uh, Grant's attack plus three, that's fine. Uh, and then, again, at the start of combat, um, having... Equal to or above 25% HP. Honestly, that, that's a pretty easy condition to meet. It's also the condition for attack speed push for, which she, which they have. So that synergizes there. And that ultimately means they're going to have plus 13 to attack and speed during combat, as, as long as they have that condition, which is great. Adaptive damage is actually pretty unique and, and pretty strong. What I will say is that more recently, you, you have a lot more units that have equal mixed defenses. So adaptive damage isn't quite as potent as it was in the early game, where you have min-max on defense or min-max on res. A lot of units now just have tons of res and defense. So I, again, I just... Adaptive damage is cool, it's very useful, it can help just turn the tide in, in, in certain matchups, but there are a lot of dangerous matchups out there where the res and the defense are on equal footing and you're not going to really get a whole lot of mileage out of that particular element. And then this, this doubling effect where you essentially get a brave effect if you have weapon triangle advantage... I don't know. I could I could leave I could take or leave that to be honest with you. I don't think that's very I don't think that's that great. I, I don't want to sound too negative about it, but if they aren't eliminating units when, when they have weapon triangle advantage without a brave effect, there's a problem. I mean they shouldn't have to rely on a brave effect in order to take out a unit where they have weapon triangle advantage. I think in most instances it's going to be overkill. So, I, I don't know. Uh, Harsh Command Plus uh, neutralizes target allies' penalties from uh, skills like Panic, Threaten, etc. And negative status effects uh, that last through the allies' next action and converts any penalties on target ally into bonuses. Attack Speed Push 4, we already talked about. Um, speed Res Far Trace 3 enables Kanto Remainder. Inflicts Speed Res minus 3 on foe during combat. So, it's a little odd because, of course, they're, they're a physical attacker, but they have adaptive damage. So that's why they decided to give them the res debuff, and the res debuff will obviously come into play as long as the enemy has less res than they do defense. And, and the speed is going to ensure that they double. It's also going to help them 
meet the condition for the second part of the weapon where they will uh, they'll have a brave effect. Um, God, I, I keep going back to that weapon triangle advantage. I feel like that is such that's so restrictive and like such a missed opportunity. I anyway, um, defense res rain three for the C slot inflicts defense res minus four on foes within two spaces during combat. That's obviously very solid, and that is going to play into you know whichever whichever stat that you're ultimately debuffing, you're going to have adaptive damage against that stat line. So um, regardless, they're going to have an advantage, or they're going to um, have a benefit to having that in-combat debuff on the enemy. All right, so I'm going to reserve judgment until we see the duo skill, but unless the duo skill actually actively gives them more weapon triangle advantage, I'm, I gotta say, I'm pretty disappointed in Mermaid Bow. When you, when you completely eliminate the second part of that weapon, it's good, but it's not incredible. Ar armored effectiveness is fine. Attack plus three is... Uh, armored effectiveness is actually very good. Um, attack plus three is fine. And then basically getting plus six to attack and speed during combat and adaptive damage, that in and of itself really doesn't make the weapon amazing. And so you really need that second part of it, and I, there's, it's just so restrictive. Well, let, let's, let's keep going here. Let's see. Again, I think the art is gorgeous. I mean, Hinoka taking aim here, fierce expression on her face. The colors here are gorgeous with the shading. They have almost this soft uh, pastel look to them a little bit. Um, you get a full view of Camilla's gorgeous hair as it's kind of flowing behind her, all those bountiful curls. Uh, and of course, you also get a nice little view of, uh, of Camilla's legs too as her skirt kind of flips up as she's like sailing forward, has her sword over her head. So yeah, I mean, again, the art is the art's gorgeous. I, th I think they did a great job with the pair. I really do. So there they are attacking in, and that's exactly what I mean. Like they just completely obliterated that unit without the brave effect. <laughs> All right, so let's take a look at the duo skill. So grants attack speed plus six to unit and flying allies within three rows and three columns centered on unit, and they can move one extra space. That is very good for flying teams. So I do think that is fantastic. Inflicts gravity on bow, dagger, tome, and staff foes within three rows and three columns centered on unit uh, if they are also infantry, armored, or cavalry foes. Gravity restricts movement to one space through its next actions. Okay, so it doesn't do anything with weapon triangle advantage, so I, I, th I still maintain my issues with this unit's weapon. I don't think... I mean, maybe I just had high expectations or something, but... Uh, I think they just flubbed it. I think that they really had a missed opportunity. They could have done something amazing with the weapon, and, and restricting that condition to weapon triangle advantage was just a huge mistake. But anyway, I digress. The first phase of this is awesome. I think that's a huge asset for flyer teams. It's amazing. The second element of it, uh, the, the area of effect gravity, in, in principle, sounds pretty great. Now, she has Kanto, so I can't remember if you can attack into the enemy uh, and then while Kanto is active, use the duo and then Kanto back. I don't know if Con I can't remember if the duo skill like ends your turn or not. So I, I just can't remember if that's the case or not. If she can do that, that's actually pretty great and pretty great utility for a team. She can swoop in, attack, use her duo skill and then fall back a little bit. And then everybody remains gravitated um, other than flying units. So that in and of itself could be very powerful and very potent if that's possible. I just don't have enough familiarity because I don't remember how that uh, interaction plays out with Kanto and duo skills. Maybe, maybe they'll demonstrate it here. I can't remember. No, they use it right away, which is fine. I could get used to this. And there they are. I love the sprite work. I love that Hinoka is on Camilla's Wyvern too. I think that's just a nice touch. So here they fly up, attacking. Yep, effective damage. Yeah, okay. Uh, and then, of course, Paralogue Story, Perilous Sea. So we are going to be getting a new Paralogue with plenty of orbs to come alongside it. Uh, right, and we already knew about the, the free unit that we're getting as well. So, starting on the 5th of August until the 4th of September. So, naturally, one full month for this banner. Um, Vika is going to be the 4-star focus unit, as we mentioned before. So, again, I have significant reservations about the about their um, their weapon and as well as their color type. That weapon triangle advantage condition for their weapon is stupid. That should not be there. If they were going to do something like that, the duo skill should have given them weapon triangle advantage against colorless units as well. That would have fixed it. That would have made it a little bit better so they had more opportunities to actually utilize that second portion of the skill 
as it currently stands, they can only affect, uh, activate that against blue units. I, I, it, it's just, I don't, I don't get it. I don't know why they would restrict it that way. It just doesn't make sense to me. You simply can't get that effect on 75% of the cast. That's just ridiculous to me. Um, but of course, they are a, a green archer. You have options of other bows that you can use on them as well. And and quite frankly, like the original effect of the weapon, the armor effectiveness, uh, as well as the the in combat buffs, that stuff it's still solid. It just it's just not amazing. Um, and that's really the unfortunate part of it. Now their duo skill is pretty great, especially if you can if you can use it in the combination of Kanto that I was talking about. Um, even if not, it's still very useful. So again, that alone makes them a pretty prized uh, unit on this banner, I have to say. Um, I think Nesala, honestly, might be better than the duo. Like, aside from the duo skill. The duo skill probably pushes the duo pair, you know, to the to the upper reaches of this banner. But Nesala is just such a stacked offensive powerhouse here that I think that he's kind of on equal footing with the duo at this point. Below them, as far as proficiency, I would certainly put Surtur. I just think that he, his skills are a little bit mismatched. Um, and then you've got Vika down there as the four-star focus unit. But again, as a four-star focus unit, she's a great opportunity for a merge project. So that's kind of my assessment of things. Uh, you already know I'm going to be going in for Hinoka and Camilla, irrespective of what their skills were. They could have given them a weapon that self-destructs and does zero damage to the enemy, and I would still pull for them. So so that's that's not a consideration or a question. I gotta say I am I am a little disappointed in the direction they went with the weapon, but hey, you know what? I've I always make do with, with what I have as far as Camilla Emblem is concerned. Um, and yeah, I, I, again, that does raise the question of whether or not this unit should go in Camilla Emblem, uh, since there is a Hinoka component to it. I don't really know. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, it doesn't even matter. Do you even care? I don't know. Um, but, um, uh, anyway, let me know in the comments below what you think of the banner and uh, if you're going to be pulling on it, who your targets are going to be. Hopefully you all enjoyed the video. If you did, please feel free to leave us a like, comment, and subscribe to the channel for more Fire Emblem Heroes content. We thank you all so much for watching and for taking time out of your day to spend with us. We really do appreciate it. Certainly hope you're all staying safe, healthy, secure, and united out there and wishing the very, very best for you, your family, and your friends. And until next time, let's predict those skies. Oh,